know, I took this course six months ago or so um, about building boxes, and I didn't try it till this week. And I probably should have tried it a little earlier, and I would have been maybe a little better at it. But um, I'm just cutting this wood up for a box, and I wanted to show you a tip. You got a binder clip at home? You just See, look, the wood's dropping, and my saw is binding. That's what that nasty sand was. So if you put this on the end to hold the two pieces of wood at, uh, on the same plane, then the saw doesn't bind anymore. See, look, so much nicer. Woo, there. OK, so this is something I, I literally took a four-hour course in. And um, look. See this? this? I made this box. It's my first attempt. And the joints aren't absolutely perfect, but these are called box joints. And see here on this old dynamite box? This is a true box joint. See how pretty it is? It's all very even. So today, I'm not going to cut random joints. I'm going to cut even quarter inch little finger joints and make it really pretty. And I'm also scaling down the size of the box, because that one's kind of well, it took a whole day to build, basically. So I'm making more of a, um, the size of a box. It's 5 by 11. And it's 3 inches deep. See, like this. And I've dyed it with aniline dyes. And they're really cool. They give the wood this incredibly deep pigment. So I'm going to put, I don't know, cosmetic brushes in it or something, or give it to somebody who needs to store their pens and pencils, you know? It's a great little gift box, this thing. OK, so let's get rid of this. Now, the first thing you, that you have to do once you've got your wood cut is mark the ends of the board. OK, so I want to make a mark on this board that tells me how deep my little finger joints have to be so that they'll go just the depth of this other board. So I could go like this, I suppose, and trace a line over here. or I could buy the $30 scribing tool at a specialty woodworking joint, which is, of course, what I did. It has a little pin in it. And uh, you can adjust it. So of course, I've, I've set it to the exact depth of the wood. And now I just hold it sort of against my hip, which is really what we were given hips for, for, for carpentry, really. And then just scribe. Whoop. Makes this really precise line across the end of the wood, all right? And, and that line is ex the exact depth of the thickness of the wood, so that when the joints go together, they're not all kind of like this. They need to be tight, all right? So you can use that. Or if you want, you might have um, one of these. You remember from Home Ec, you had to tr do that thing where you trace the pattern onto the material? So you might have a tool like this. Um, or you might have a rotary cutter in your sewing kit. OK, raid the kitchen for a pizza cutter, if that's all you can find. Because you can also just use that, measure the depth of the wood um, with, with a tape measure or a ruler, like so, and then just transfer that depth to the other end of your piece of wood, like this. Then make a little mark and draw the line like that. OK, so you don't have to have the really fancy woodworking tools. OK, so that, in fact, that's a little bit more visible than that smart little scribe line over here. Uh, next thing to, is to decide how big do you want your little teeth to be, or your big teeth. For example, this joint could just be one big tooth, and then one missing tooth, and one big tooth. I'm going to go a little bit more elegant, a little bit more petite. I'm going to make quarter inch ones. So I want to lay the ruler along like this, and then just make a little mark at every quarter of an inch like that. OK, now the reason I picked a quarter of an inch, and this is something you need to consider, is look at my chisel set. Pick a measurement for your joints that is exactly the depth of one of your chisels. I'm going to put the thing back on this for a moment. So I'm going to finish marking where I need to cut my little teeth, and then I'm going to start cutting them. When you're thoroughly engrossed in making something, insignificant problems drop away. You just stop worrying about what to cook for dinner, whether or not to have children, 
why men like thongs? Okay, so I've made all the teeth marks that I want, my little quarter inch teeth marks, but I'm gonna start to saw this thing, right? To, to saw down into those teeth marks, but I'm just gonna be guessing across the top of the wood unless I've made a mark there also. So if you have some kind of little squaring device, this is an actual carpenter's tool called a tri-square, and all you do with that is line up with the marks that you've made for where the teeth are, just make another line across the top and move across and do all the little lines. So this is the picky part. This is a little finicky, but if you don't set it up right, you're gonna be sorry later. So let me turn this around so that I can actually see the lines, uh, my, the teeth lines that I'm cutting to. And I'm setting it low because I don't want the um, board going uh, 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 back and forth on me. I want it to be fairly square. So this is a Japanese pull saw, but it's a back saw. It has this spine on it. And the reason I'm using this to cut these joints is because I want a really fine, precise, non-wobbly cut. If I try to use a saw like this, which is not a back saw, or, you know, doesn't have that spine on it, I'll be in trouble. So this might be the only thing that you really, you can fake this uh, box joints with most of the tools, but you do need a, a little gentleman's back saw. That's what they used to be called. Um, I like a pull saw. You can get these in push saw models too, but it needs to be really fine. Okay, so I'm lining up the saw and I'm gonna try to keep it as perpendicular as possible. And I only wanna go as deep as that score line. I don't wanna go any deeper than that or I'll look like my little teeth have gum disease. When you make something, never let inexperience get in the way of ambition. With everything that's ever been done, someone had to do it the first time not knowing how it would turn out. Like when those monks invented beer, and then drank the beer, and then woke up in the bell tower, naked. Okay, so that didn't take very long at all. So now I'm gonna push this out of the vise, dust her off, and it's ready uh, for chiseling. Okay, now this is my favorite part, as it turns out. And that's because these little teeth pop out so quickly, it's a miracle if your chisel is sharp. All right, so here's the deal with lining up your chisel. The chisel has to be placed just in front of the scribe line that you drew. And that's because as the chisel descends into the wood, it tends to displace wood and it ends up backing up into the, into the wood a bit. You'll have cut them too deep if you don't set the chisel uh, just ahead of that line. All right, now, you can hold your chisel like this, but it's very wobbly. So the way they teach you to hold it, if you take a course, is just low like that, more like a pen. And that way you have a bit more control over it. Keep checking to see that you haven't wiggled it. Don your safety glasses, because when these chips fly, they fly, okay? And if you have a wooden mallet around somewhere, or you can buy a cheap um, uh, plastic mallet, it works way, way better than a steel hammer. And they're big, and that means you, can't, you don't really have to think about your hammer hitting the top of the chisel. You can focus your eyes on the blade of the chisel so that you know it's going in straight and not bouncing around. All right, so here it goes. Okay, oop, I already got a bit off, see? But in order not to split the wood, and this is why I, I really did need to scribe it on the other side, so I was being lazy. Let me just do it now. I need to, um, I need to be able to flip it over and actually chisel the other side as well. Because otherwise, let me just show you, I'll sacrifice one. The wood tends to split away as it goes down through the bottom. See that? The, okay, it's not terrible, but the, the splitting has occurred here. If I had chiseled from the other side as well, which I'll now try to show you. Now, it's every other tooth, so I go to the next one, and I set the chisel just in front of the line. 
and sink it and hold it more like a pen than a than a some kind of a plunger. I'm watching. I'm just getting it started and then I'm going to flip the board over and do the same thing on the other side so that I don't, you know, just wreck up the wood. I want to I want these joints to be as clean as I can get them. Okay, and that's really all I need to do. I, I just get, score it really. And now I'll go See? You nailed me right on the chin. That's why you're wearing the glasses. Okay? So this goes really fast. I'm going to uh, knock out every other tooth, and then I'm going to be ready to do another side, and then start joining them up together. Oh, one other tiny thing. If you're having real trouble keeping your chisel vertical, just use a cheater block. This happens to be triangular, but it could just be a, a rectangular shape. It's got sandpaper glued onto the other side or stapled as in this case. And you just set it, I'll show you. You set it right along the line so that when you put your chisel in place, your chisel is leaning on that block. And that way it won't start backing up like this or doing weird stuff on you. And it doesn't skid because it's got that sandpaper base. Good day. And now I'm just taking the, um, uh, it's called a bastard file, okay? Gotta love the name. And um, I'm just using it to remove the little hairy bits, really. You use your bastard file to remove the hairy bits. And um, that's because I just want, I want the joints to be tidy. And see like little fibers like this? That'll drive you crazy when you see your finished box and it's got hairy bits on it. Get those, get rid of those right away, right? So, there we go. Um, I wanted to show you one other thing. Remember I was talking about that little Japanese saw, the back saw? There's one other way to go. It's an $8 saw, okay? You'll use that back saw a lot if you do own one, but if you don't, this is an $8 coping saw. You can use it to, to do the same thing I did with the back saw, to saw down through the things. If you don't want to buy the chisels either, you can just use this saw like this, watch. Okay, that takes part of it out. Then I come from the other direction. Like so. See? Okay, then I gotta file it out. Because it's not as neat and tidy, but the same effect can still be achieved. Cool! For eight bucks with a little coping saw. All right? So that's an option. Okay, back to this, because this is what we're excited about now. This little baby is all cut out, and now you, n you need to dry fit it. Y you've cut all the ends basically the same. So find the cleanest sides and put them on the outside, and then dry fit it. <laughs> okay, that totally doesn't fit at all. <laughs> so I'm gonna just go to the other end. Just go to the other end, okay? Oh, pff. unbelievable. Okay, so um, then, well, that fits really nicely. <laughs> Feeling smug now. And then let's try this one. Um, usually the first joints that you cut are pretty loose and wobbly like this. And then by the time you get a bit of practice at it, your final um, chill, that's never gonna go together. <laughs> Um, that's okay though. Honestly, just keep moving the parts around. I, I know there's a way to get this to go together. <laughs> Remember when your mother told you it wasn't nice to grunt? Well, there are times when it is nice. Like when you're moving the couch to cover the stain where the cat barfed, or doing any kind of heavy physical labor. Your body needs an outlet. And a grunt is a lot nicer than a prolapsed pyloric sphincter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you find yourself making the kinds of sounds you made when you gave birth, then it's time to use the wooden mallet. That would be the, this thing. And I'm just going to... Actually, the joint, the joint should be about this tight. You should, you should need to hammer them together. That's how tight they should be. 
And um, <laughs> I'm making this up as I go along, clearly. Okay, now that it's together, if you have a victory dance, it's time to do it, okay? That's mine. I don't like to get too carried away because then something bad happens usually. Okay, so now that you've got your box together, number the darn sides so that you never have to go through that again. M number them down low so you're never going to really see them. One, two, three, four. Okay, now we need a bottom, huh? We certainly all need one of those. And I've actually cut this one out, but let me just show you how you do it. First, you want to make sure that the box is square. Okay, take it back over to your, your scrap wood here that you were working from. And I'm just going to fit this corner of the box over that corner of the wood. And that becomes, so I've got two sides cut already. Because I'm in the mood to glue, not cut. So I want to get to the gluing as fast as I can. Then I'm just going to trace with a pencil the inside line like that. Okay? And then I'll cut it along there. And that gives me my bottom. All right, so the bottom is cut out. It's time to glue, baby. Okay? So it's going to be like this. I'm going to take the pieces apart now, lay them down open and flat, like this, like this, OK? So I can see all the little numbers, one, two, three, four. I'm going to use cabinet maker's glue. It's specialty glue. It dries a little bit slower, cures a little bit slower than the white glue or yellow glue. So just a little bit on a paintbrush and start buttering up those joints. I like to do all these ones first, and then all these ones, and then all these ones, then put it down in the place that you found it, and move on to the next corner. And then everything goes together at once. I'm just dropping the box onto the bottom. With surgical precision, I might add. OK, now the glue is going to take about um, probably 90 minutes to set up really strongly. So this is the time to clamp it, OK? I can unclamp it after 90 minutes, but it'll still take a further 24 hours to get really nice. Mm, that just cinches in those joints so nicely. Got to have some clamps in your life. And put it right in the center of the box so that it, it, it squeezes both top and bottom. And then you need another clamp running this way. This is a rather large clamp, but I just didn't have enough of the smaller ones. And I had to use every clamp I owned and borrow some on that bigger box. So you can see, you use up the clamps pretty quickly. OK? Now, walking away. This needs to set up. And then uh, I want to show you some neat colors of aniline dyes. They're gorgeous. I'm putting my cosmetic brushes in my little box. See? Pretty. Look, I added these little um, copper nails to keep the bottom in place. And so it won't fall out under the enormous weight of my cosmetic brushes. And um, see how flat? I mean, this is a beautiful, vivid color that the aniline dyes gave me. And, um, but when I put tongue oil, it's a non-toxic oil. Look, does that not, is that not incredible, how that brings it out? So a couple of coats of that, and it'll come up to a very high shine and look really pretty. So um, that's just a little secret tip to know about. And the aniline dyes, they come in little packages that look like this, very unobtrusive. But man, look at the colors you get out of them. You know, they're beautiful. That's the, um, the original colors. And then you mix them to get all kinds of other colors. So they used to be uh, very illegal, aniline dyes, because they were cut with mineral spirits and all kinds of toxic substances. But they figured out a way now to make them water-based, which is fantastic. So if you pre-mix them and put them in little juice bottles or, or containers that normally have food, label them poison, keep them out of the reach of the kids, because they look like some kind of cool, groovy juice that you might want to drink. And you don't want to ever do that. OK, so you've made your first box joint box, and you're feeling that glow. The victory dance is coming back to you. 
Let's, let me just show you what you could move on to if you got good at box joints. These are dovetail joints. And this is a, a toolbox made by an artisan named Andrew Strom. And it's absolutely beautiful craftsmanship. It's, um, it's a toolbox. See, you, just, you pick it up and carry it. So that's a lovely idea. And um, then this is another dovetail joint. This is a jewelry box. And um, at some point, I'm going to attempt those. But they're a little bit trickier. So. If you have never even picked up a tool in your life, I guarantee you can make something like this. And then you can make a littler one for your lipsticks, oh baby. Is that grand or what? As Robert Browning said, a minute's success pays for the failure of years. One well-chiseled set of box joints makes up for every date that ever ended with I'll call you. Those guys would sure be sorry now if they could see your box. <laughs>